Thank you. That concludes the debate on Scottish Government priorities tackling the climate emergency. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on Motion 13757 in the name of Gillian Martin on Circular Economy Scotland Bill at Stage 3. And as members will be aware, I am required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of a bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. And in, the case of my, in case of this bill, it is my view that no provision of the Circular Economy Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. And before we move to the debate, I call on the Cabinet Secretary to signify Crown consent to the Bill. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. For the purposes of Rule 9.11 of Standing Orders, I advise the Parliament that His Majesty, having been informed of the purport of Circular Economy Scotland Bill, has consented to place his prerogative and interests, insofar as they are affected by the Bill, at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. We move on to the debate. I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Gillian Martin to speak to and move the motion up to seven minutes, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I am delighted to open the debate on the Circular Economy Scotland Bill and to move the motion uh, in my name. And I begin by thanking so many people that have uh, helped us get to this point. I want to thank the convener um, of the committee, the clerks, and all the members of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee for their stage one report, for their extensive four weeks extensive uh, scrutiny at stage two, I think it was, positive debate, um, and for all the other members and stakeholders who have engaged so constructively with me, um, I would also like to thank the Finance and Public Administration and Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committees for their thorough considerations. But I particularly want to give my thanks and gratitude to my predecessor, um, I ho hope that she will be in the chamber. I think she maybe is in the chamber somewhere. I hope she's here to see this, because I really do want to thank Lorna Slater. Lorna Slater's dedication and hard work in developing the bill uh, throughout the, the lead up to stage one and through stage one, her immense contribution can't be overstated, and her personal support to me as I took the reins at stage two. I want to thank her. I also want to extend my heartfelt thanks to the members of the Bill team for their hard work and their support, expertise and tireless efforts throughout the Bill process. It can't have been easy changing Minister halfway through. It's daunting, um, but because of Ms Slater's thorough engagement, the cross-party working that she did and my Bill team's support have been able to get us to this point where we all have the opportunity today to pass a Bill that we can very much be proud of. There is real passion and enthusiasm for a circular economy, and I see that from the members' contributions from the stakeholders that I have met. Uh, and I have really been also struck by the spirit of cross-party working. We may not agree on all the methods and what we have actually managed to get into the Bill, but I think we all agree that there is a real need to accelerate our efforts in the circular economy. And um, I think a lot of our constituents would like to see more of that type of working across the Chamber and more of that consensus politics that I think that the, the deliberations in this Bill uh, exemplify. And at every stage, members have, have championed initiatives that are leading the way in our own constituencies and regions and others that they visited in repair, recycle, reuse, the third sector, the local councillors that are being in innovative, the innovative businesses. And reference to those has really helped to oil the wheels of this bill. Um, and I think that the, this is going to be a, 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 a crucial a piece of legislation which is a springboard to the waste managers throughout Scotland of whatever status in ramping up action. Making more sustainable use of our resources in Scotland is fundamental to tackling the twin crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss. And during the passing of the bill, we have listened to feedback in the bill. I will do in a second, Mr. Simpson. During the passage of the bill, we have listened to feedback. The bill is stronger in promoting action further up the waste hierarchy, and I thank my colleagues for that, for pushing the government to put more in the bill, particularly to reference more reuse in the waste hierarchy, and be uh, recognisant uh, of the, the role that reuse, refill and take back has on the whole life carbon emissions of goods, products and materials. And I will take Mr Simpson now. 
Graham Simpson. Uh, I'm very grateful. Um, can the minister say, if we were to look in two or three years' time, um, what difference this bill would have made to anything? What will we notice? Minister. Well, it is my fervent hope that this bill gives the, the springboard for all the local waste collectors and managers throughout Scotland to come together to share best practice, to have increased targets that are put to us that they want to achieve, or particularly on household recycling, that we are able to know that those councils uh, in particular have got their, their shoulders to the wheel behind because they are the ones that have made the decisions in this area and we have given them the, the, the power to do so. I'll, I'll, I want to continue, Ms Boyack. I might be able to take you later on. For the first time, there is a statutory duty to prepare a circular economy strategy and associated targets for Scotland that will embed circular thinking within government and across future administrations. We are all consumers. We must play our part in reducing waste. That is why it's so far, this bill is so far-reaching. It impacts us all, from the goods we buy to the, what we put in our recycling bins. Everyone in the country should experience a modern, easy-to-use recycling and waste service that helps them do the right thing for the planet. The new powers in the bill will give ministers and local authorities the tools they need to deliver that, and that speaks to Mr Simpson's point. And I'll take Ms Boyack now. Very Boyack. grateful for the Minister taking intervention. Um, one of the things we debated in stage two was the impact of fines on potential householders, particularly thinking about tenements or shared properties. And I notice it's come up in the press again. So I think it'd be quite helpful if the minister would repeat the key principles of the bill and the individual householders should not automatically be worried. It's about persistent offenders and where there's evidence that local authorities can identify. Minister. Very helpfully, Ms Boyack has probably set out what I would have said in response to her asking about this. This is about repeat persistent offenders, the types of people that really are a problem in, all our in, in many of our communities. It is not for the people that want to do the right thing who have made a mistake. It is for people who have egregiously or deliberately um, contaminated wa uh, recycling waste. So I, I give my assurance, and hopefully I did so at stage two. Um, the improvement programme, I want to talk about the voluntary code of practice through code, that's got, we developed through co-design to explore opportunities to enhance activities to promote reuse repair on a voluntary and recommended uh, basis. The improvement programme is under development as an alternative to financial pe penalties for local authority recycling targets, and that's going to offer a more practical route to share best practice. So much best practice that we heard from members and stakeholders that are happening in councils in certain parts of Scotland, the other parts of Scotland can really benefit from as well. Um, I uh, also want to say that I really do believe that this bill is, is, uh, recognises that the co-design process is based on the principles of the Verity House Agreement and the New Deal for Business that is central to delivering the transformation we need. I want to particularly thank Councillor McGregor at COSLA for the really positive and construction discussions they had both with me and with Ms Slater on the, on the passage of the bill. Um, and I am delighted that she cited this engagement as a fine example of working in the spirit of Verity House Agreement. Uh, of course, I do recognise there are some concerns. Um, I hope that most of them have been addressed through the, the passage of the bill and the framework nature of the bill. But I do, I do really feel it's important that we obviously make enabling legislation so that we can have action happen at local level with the people that know the, their, their, their services best. Um, I, I, won't, I won't say much more. I must um, ask you to uh, conclude, as, as I'm, ask, I'm being asked to conclude, I may be able to pick up some of the points that I've missed in my opening speech as I finish the debate. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Maurice Golden. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, in the previous debate, the Cabinet Secretary, Mary McCallan, referenced climate activists in Malawi appearing to suggest that Scottish Conservatives had criticised them, criticised them in some way. I have spoken to my colleagues. We could find no basis for this. And based on what the Cabinet Secretary has said, we are very supportive of those uh, climate activists, and I would uh, want to ensure that that is on the record. Uh, moving to uh, today, I would like to thank the clerks and all those supporting the bill. As I have made clear previously, the Scottish Conservatives support the general principles of the bill. A circular economy is a simple concept. Keep materials in use for as long as possible to extract the maximum value from them. It is so simple, in fact, you could be forgiven for thinking we surely must be doing that anyway. But Scotland's economy is just 
circular according to the circularity gap report. The hope was that this circular economy bill could shift the needle and see us catch up with the rest of the UK, which is 7.5 per cent circular. But as I have pointed out before, the bill as introduced was little more than a glorified waste and litter bill. Important issues, of course, but hardly the ambition we need to build a sustainable economy and see it thrive. Members will remember my promise at stage one to work constructively to strengthen the bill. I kept my end of the bargain, as did Scottish Conservative colleagues, mm -hmm. submitting dozens of amendments at stage two on everything from reuse to procurement to human rights. But those sincere efforts from opposition parties have been met with a wall of opposition from the SNP at both stage two and stage three. For example, yesterday the SNP opposed ensuring a code of practice for local authority waste collection to be produced by March 2026, even though that's the date the SNP claim it will be ready. On top of which, they opposed providing local authorities with sufficient resources to carry out the actions required of them, and for good measure, they also voted against their own recycling targets, which is confusing given they claim they still intend to meet them. Yeah. Such opposition is especially disappointing given how bad recycling has become under the SNP. Even after more than a decade of trying, they still haven't managed to deliver their 2013 household recycling target, so new thinking is clearly needed. But the new approach of the Scottish Government is exactly the same as the strategy deployed for the last 20 years. At least it's circular. But as I explained in my opening comments, recycling is not the primary goal of waste management. Hence, the Scottish Conservative amendments to ensure support for prepare for reuse is included and even prioritised when it comes to household waste, unsold goods and local authority reuse schemes. But again, the SNP acted to block progress this time opposing a vital inclusion of reuse and repair in the bill. On a more positive note, the bill will, for the first time, require the production of a circular economy strategy that is regularly reviewed. Of course, alongside the strategy, we need tangible goals to reach for and to measure progress against. But the SNP's original plan was for targets to be optional. That just isn't good enough, and it creates a terrible market signal for businesses and investors that the Scottish Government isn't serious about building a circular economy, which is why the Scottish Conservatives submitted amendments to ensure circular economy targets were included. Yeah. Of course, if we expect the private sector to get involved at all, then the public sector should also be contributing. But yet again, the SNP opposed this, voting against a requirement for public bodies to produce circular economy plans. Happy to. Minister. I'm generally keen to, to have a tone of debate uh, this afternoon, which reflects my experience of working on this bill. But I genuinely thought that I worked very constructively and collaboratively with every single party in this chamber. That doesn't seem to have been Mr Golden's experience Yet that's my experience of working with him. Maurice Golden. Uh, I think we're perhaps talking about two separate aspects. So my feeling is one of frustration and deflation regarding the bill, but I certainly would regard um, myself and the soon to be Cabinet Secretary as having a very constructive uh, relationship and constructive discussions. But ultimately, the proof is in the pudding, and that is one that leaves a very sour taste in the mouth. Yeah. So at one point, it became an outright farce, with the SNP even opposing the circular economy bill, including a definition of what the circular economy is. What it all adds up to is an impression the SNP don't really care about creating a circular economy just look at the foot dragging to even get it introduced. No comment regarding the current minister. I had even to threaten to introduce my own bill to embarrass them into doing it. But even if the SNP aren't interested, it has been encouraging to see 
many across Parliament who are, in addition to the dozen of amendments submitted by Scottish Conservatives. Let me also pay credit to Sarah Boyack, uh, Monica Lennon and indeed uh, SNP MSP Ben McPherson for their constructive uh, suggestions. So despite um, missed opportunities in the Bill, it can still make a difference on waste management and littering if Ministers can at least to commit to properly implementing it, the measures it contains. That is the task ahead to ensure they do not shirk that responsibility. Thank you. And I now call on Sarah Boyack. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I also want to start by thanking the committee, the clerks and all those organisations who did work tirelessly to get the legislation we urgently need to deliver economy, the proper debate that we need. And particularly, I'd agree with the Minister on the cross-party work, especially in amendments at stages two and three. Um, I was particularly glad that I was able to secure support for my amendment with support from the Minister's team last night to make sure that it's vital that guidance will be introduced to ensure that restrictions on the disposal of consumer goods to ensure that dam damaged or contaminated goods are not reused where it would not be safe. Um, so I did very much welcome that. Um, I don't think the bill is as good as it could have been, but I do think because of the constructive work that was done at stage two and three that it is better than the draft. My personal view is I still think it's a missed opportunity because the bill is more about recycling and waste management than seizing the opportunity highlighted in the name to deliver the circular economy our constituents, our businesses, our planet and environment need. We don't have the clear purpose proposed by Maurice Golden at stage three and myself at stage two that would have added strength to the bill. And we'll still have to wait to see the heavy lifting required to maximise the benefits of a circular economy, because it's the implementation that will be crucial. And one key issue that I think is important to highlight is funding. For local authorities, that will be key as to whether the ambitions in this framework legislation is actually delivered. And our Labour colleagues in Wales understood that, which is why the Labour government worked very hard in negotiating with local government colleagues there to deliver one of the highest recycling rates in the world. But it took a decade of investment, a billion pounds, to make sure they had the infrastructure and capacity to deliver on what were both pragmatic and and ambitious targets. And in the bill, uh, if it's brief, yep. It's very brief to recognise what the Welsh Government have achieved, but also to, to mention that I think it's important that it's the, the deliverers on the ground that actually come back to us and say what they want to achieve so that we can look at the funding aspect of what they want to do. Sarah Boyack because it was a negotiation in Wales, as I understand it. But in the, in the analysis of the bill, the Finance and Public Administration Committee raised concerns about the pressures in local authorities and said more work was going to need to be done to address cost savings and changes to revenues that the bill would lead to. Um, and a key issue is the code of practice, so it's key that partnership work and funding takes place. I think the waste hierarchy is important because we tend to focus on how we deal with waste rather than supporting our communities and businesses to repurpose, reuse, repair, recycle goods and products and materials rather than seeing them going to waste and damaging our environment and our communities. And a key issue, which is where the circular economy is critical, is how we design products in the first place so they don't become obsolete with valuable materials that could be reused being dumped. And I think one of the missed opportunities that I hope the Minister will come back to was an amendment from Maurice Golden last night to require, local, uh, to, to require uh, public bodies to prepare a circular economy plan. And I think that's critical because public procurement is key. That would incentivise investment in circular economy products, practices and supply chains. It would raise awareness in public bodies and it would actually make a real difference. So I think that's something I hope the Minister will come back to. Uh, I think how we deal with plastics that damage our environment, whether it's on land or sea, is something where we need stronger action. So it, it's coming together to think about what more can be done here. Um, I was recently contacted by a constituent as a school teacher was taking school students to take part in a beach clean and they were absolutely shocked to see the levels of pollution that was there and a lot of it was plastic. So I think one of the things in terms of implementing this bill that will be key will be investing in schools, involving them in the process of discussion so that we educate young people about the damage that's caused by waste and what they can do to stop it. Because I know uh, talking to people who are parents, sometimes the kids feed them 
them that information from schools. So there's something about making everybody aware of the impact of avoiding waste and dealing with waste we have much more responsibly and making demands on companies, local authorities and we need to see support for the fantastic community projects that enable our constituents to reuse and repair products. There's a lot more we could be doing here. Um, I've talked about missed opportunities. I want to finish on a couple. One was my uh, global responsibility ambition, not to offshore our waste and leave other countries dealing with it. Scottish waste exports have risen from 0.4 megatons in 2004 to 1.5 megatons in 2022. That is a massive increase. So thinking about our climate ambitions, trying to be a global conclude, leader, we need to do more and take more seriously where our materials come from, human rights and environmental impacts, and make sure it's built into our everyday work and make sure the public sector leads on this because we're going to have to come back to this bill. This is not job finished. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Lorna Slater up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Circular Economy Bill is an important one for the Scottish Greens because of its significance in changing the shape of the economy in Scotland from a linear economy to a circular one. No longer is it acceptable to casually extract materials to make items that will be used only once or just a few times and then throw them away. Going forward, the burden of minimising waste and handling it when it's unavoidable needs to be firmly placed on the businesses who create it and who profit from it. The Circular Economy Bill is a significant step forward on this journey. I am grateful to the Minister for picking up this bill on very short notice at Stage 2 and successfully bringing it to Stage 3 today. I would also like to thank all of the officials who have worked on this bill, with myself, with the Minister and with members across this chamber. A better team of officials you will not find. Working with them was a privilege and a joy. And thank you to the members of this chamber, everyone who sat up late last night and those members who took the care and time to suggest amendments to the bill and collaborate to make this the best circular economy bill that it could be. The powers conveyed by this bill sit in the gap between the powers that Scotland already has but isn't necessarily using and the powers that Scotland doesn't and can't have because they are reserved to Westminster. Many matters that are critical for creating a circular economy are not devolved to the Scottish Parliament. Matters around consumer goods, labelling, international trade and design of products. Extraction of oil and gas from the North Sea is a significant contributor to Scotland's material consumption, but it isn't something that the Scottish Parliament has power over. So we are dependent on governments in Westminster following our lead and matching the level of ambition that Scotland has shown this week. I challenge the incoming Westminster government to do that. This bill is a framework bill. It empowers the Scottish government to bring forward measures such as charges on single-use items. It builds on powers that Scotland already has, for example, to require businesses to take back products that they sell or produce. The measure of success of this bill lies not simply in passing it, but in taking up the powers that it conveys and putting in place practical actions. A charge on single-use cups to motivate consumers to carry their own reusable cup, modelled on the successful charge on plastic bags, which has led all of us to getting used to carrying our own bags to the shop. The Scottish Government needs to move forward with requiring particularly large businesses to report on food waste and surplus, and to get on with delivering a ban on the landfilling and incineration of unsold durable goods. It is an urgent matter to move directly into delivering these measures and the other measures proposed in the waste route map. When people ask, what can we do to protect the environment? Here is where the answer lies. The answers to getting plastic out of our oceans, to reducing emissions and preventing pollution are here. Prevent the waste from being created in the first place. Reduce the use of unnecessary plastics and design products and businesses for zero waste. 
I challenge the Scottish Government and members across this chamber not only to pass this bill today, but to work together to urgently deliver on the promise that is being made by this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Liam MacArthur. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you. Can I, like others, start with a few thank yous to the organisations, individuals uh, and, and others who provided evidence and informed um, the scrutiny process of this bill uh, and acknowledge the NZ committee uh, and the work they did in undertaking that scrutiny, I think, pretty forensically. Um, this is an area of policy that's always benefited from um, good cross-party uh, collaboration. I think that's been in evidence uh, here. And as a result, as Sarah Boyack was saying, we have a bill that is, I think, much improved on what was introduced. Uh, in particular, can I commend the MSPs who led the consideration of 100 and whatever amendments uh, yesterday evening. I think it did allow for constructive changes to be made. Also useful challenges that then prompted commitments uh, from the Minister. Uh, special mention to Graeme Simpson, who demonstrated that you don't have to press every amendment to a vote in order to make your point. I uh, hope it is a lesson that others uh, have learned. Uh, but finally, thanks uh, to the, the Minister, who, as others have said, uh, had this added to her portfolio uh, at late notice and uh, midway through the, the process. Uh, I'm very grateful to her for the collaborative approach she's taken in her engagement with me, but I detect that's the same uh, across the, the chamber. And its approach, it would be fair to say, that was adopted by our predecessor, uh, Lorna Slater, as well. At stage one, I echoed concerns expressed by other members that the bill was light on detail, lacked clarity, and didn't measure up to the uh, lofty ambitions uh, that it had, and indeed the needs of the moment. The final bill, I think, is certainly not perfect, and it leaves much of the heavy lifting to a future circle economy strategy and targets to be developed uh, in due course by ministers and others. But nonetheless, uh, there have been welcome changes to add much needed detail, as well as provisions embedding just transition principles and strengthening the recognition of a circular economy as one where reducing consumption is just as important as reducing waste. I also very much welcome commitments made by the Minister yesterday regarding issues that did not make it into the final text, including, again, as, uh, as um, Sarah Boyack indicated, the joint working that will be necessary with the UK Government to reduce waste exports, uh, which mask uh, our own waste and emissions while causing uh, untold damage to uh, the environment overseas. Uh, Presiding officer, as I said at stage one, this debate and bill are timely. It's more urgent than ever that we reduce our consumption-based emissions to combat climate change. And in that context, and with a commitment to ensuring the necessary follow-through in the circular economy strategy on the other undertakings made by the Minister, I can confirm that Scottish Liberal Democrats will be voting to support the circular economy bill at decision time later on this evening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And we move to winding up speeches. And I call on Mark Ruskell. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you uh, very much, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm, I'm very proud to see this bill um, passed today. And it's been a long time in the making. Um, COVID delayed a bill on circular economy in the last session of Parliament. Um, and it's really welcome to see it before us today um, to be passed. Uh, and it has been a product um, of some really positive cross-party working across the chamber. I think in many ways it has shown Holyrood working at its best. And I would like to join other members in paying tribute to my Green colleague, Lorna Slater. I'm, I'm really pleased that she took the opportunity to actually speak in this debate as well. Um, she successfully led the bill's development, all the stakeholder negotiation and drafting, and secured a positive recommendation from the committee at stage one. So uh, I'd like to thank Lorna Slater and the bill team for their work, and, and also uh, to thank the new minister, Gillian Martin, who picked up the bill incredibly short notice in, in somewhat bizarre circumstances, um, but has very much kept the spirit of cooperative working alive throughout stage two and stage three. Now, last night we saw amendments from every party in this chamber, chamber passed into the bill. And I'd certainly thank the environmental NGOs for inspiring many of the amendments and positive discussions with MSP colleagues. And who knows, uh, maybe if everyone who supported those amendments had actually voted last night, there might have been more actually agreed in the bill. But throughout its passage, the government has made clear that this bill would set a framework for action on the circular economy. It is a framework bill, and I think there's been a, an ongoing debate in committee about what's appropriate to put on the face of the bill and what's appropriate to come afterwards. I think that key element of co-design is really important. There's also, of course, the elephant in the room, which is the Internal Market Act. And we'll see how the next incoming Westminster government 
uh, treats that Act and treats Scotland's uh, ability to be able uh, to take action and to bring in um, instruments on the back of the circular economy bill. Now, um, you know, some have, have said, and I think Sarah Boyack, you know, mentioned perhaps with a sense of disappointment that, that this is primarily focused on household recycling. But, you know, I don't think the bill is. But, but of course, there's an important element within the bill that is about household recycling. And, you know, we have to recognise that that has plateaued. Limits of uh, levels of, of household recycling plateaued in Scotland in recent years. Uh, and that it's important that this bill equips councils to be able to take the next big step in investing in recycling. Um, I'm a little bit short for time, I think, unless there's time in hand. Um, I'd like to just turn to a couple of the amendments then that uh, the Greens moved last night. I mean, I'm, I'm really pleased that we've made progress to ensure that ministers will consider reuse, refill and take back schemes. Um, the critical thing now is to ensure that ministers um, don't just consider it, but actually act on these powers going forward. Um, regret we couldn't make perhaps more headway with amendments on public funding. Um, I'm also a little bit disappointed that the amendment to strengthen reporting requirement on public bodies actually came from Morris Gold and wasn't passed. But I hope this is a discussion that can continue. And I thank in particular APRS for their, their support on cross-party discussions in that area. Um, I do welcome the Minister's offer to look at how the issue of critical minerals recycling can be addressed in other parts of the government's energy policy. And I think the case set out by Friends of Scotland and why Scotland needs to plan for how we prolong the use of key minerals, such as copper, lithium, particularly in the renewable sector, is a strong one. And I hope to see mention of critical minerals recycling reuse in the upcoming energy strategy. Um, I'm also pleased that the Greens have strengthened the Bill's focus on education and skills, uh, needs for the transition to a more circular economy. And lastly, uh, our amendments, which require ministers to consider the carbon emissions across a product's entire life cycle when preparing circular economy strategies. This is going to be absolutely critical to address the climate crisis. Presiding officer, in closing, this is an excellent bill, uh, but it is only the first step in delivering a circular economy. And the point made by Lorna Slater is absolutely critical. It's about how the powers are now used. And the Scottish Greens will continue to push for action. It will continue to push for this government to actually use the powers that this bill will give it to actually deliver that circular economy. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Monica Lennon. Up to four minutes, please. Sir. Oh, I think it's working now. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, like others, I place on record my thanks to um, the Scottish Parliament staff, uh, particularly in space, in supporting the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee, all the members of the NZ Committee and Scottish Government officials for their support. And like others, pleased to hear Lona Slater make a contribution uh, and also thank uh, Gillian Martin for her uh, generosity in, in terms of her time at short notice to work with not just me but many colleagues around the, the chamber. Um, Scottish Labour does believe that the bill as amended is stronger and better than how it started but that is testament to the cross party working right across the chamber. That's why I'm a little surprised that Morris Golden doesn't seem his usual enthusiastic self today, but perhaps a little bit of tiredness has set in. But I think every part of uh, the chamber has, has added to, to the bill, and I think that is um, a good thing. At every stage of the bill, Scottish Labour has made sure that innocent householders are not criminalised for the actions of others or for making a, a simple mistake in terms of the wrong thing ending up in the wrong bin. And I think that's important. And we've also tried to embed in, in the whole approach uh, incentivising good behaviour and creating opportunities. And in closing the debate for Scottish Labour today, um, I just want to take a moment to reflect on the contributions of my own amendments and my colleague Sarah Boyax. I think they do strengthen the bill, particularly in relation to provisions for due diligence, in relation to human rights and environmental impact in terms of global supply chains. I think that's really um, important. And our approach will also ensure that the, strength in, that the secondary legislation to come will be strengthened uh, on reducing carbon emissions and exempting food from the previous or provisions relating to unsold consumer goods and I'd like to thank the government for working constructively with us. However, 
we are disappointed in the sense that we would have liked to see the Scottish Government go further to strengthen the bill, particularly around reuse and the just transition, because some stakeholders wanted to see a closer alignment with the Just Transition Principles and the Climate Change Act. Um, our amendments would have helped with that, but again, we will continue to work with the Scottish Government to do more. And I am pleased that the Scottish Government has committed to take forward work in relation to improving access to reusable nappies. We will see that in the route map and hopefully in the co-design process with local authorities. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary, um, or currently the Minister, will establish a short life working group to work with COSLA and other partners, building on the findings of the James Hutton um, Institute's report and the work we've seen in North Ayrshire Council. Um, I know that we are very short in time, even though we spent a lot of work on this um, bill. I think it is fair to say that some stakeholders have been concerned that this government wasn't being ambitious enough because we've just had a debate on the climate emergency and we are putting faith in the government in terms of circular economy. But we do hope and expect to see real action through the strategy and the route map. And I think it is important to say that we do welcome some of the clarity around funding, but it is about having the right framework, having a fair approach and also having the right funding, because we need to see our local authorities in particular empowered to take this work forward. I will end, presiding officer, uh, with the words not of circular economy guru Maurice Golden today, because he's a bit tired, but Ellen MacArthur, who said, if we could build an economy that would use things rather than use them up, we could build a future. So I hope those words will resonate. That is the opportunity before us to create a new economy where we use rather than use up. I thank the presiding officer for her generosity and I look forward to working with the minister. Thank you. And I call on Graham Simpson. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you. Presiding officer, it's always useful when considering a bill to have a look at what it's meant to achieve. So we need to look no further than the general principles of this bill, which we all agree to. And they are to prepare and publish a circular economy strategy, to make provision about circular economy targets, to make provision about the reduction, recycling and management of waste and for connected purposes. Now, I said in the stage one debate that you don't need a bill to have a strategy. Incidentally, I agree with the First Minister that we have too many of them. And you don't need a bill to set targets. I also said that I had concerns about the framework nature of the bill and that I wouldn't support it if it wasn't improved. Now, when the marathon stage two had ended, I was definitely of a mind to oppose it because the minister had dug in and had opposed a series of very sensible amendments which would have led to greater reuse and greater recycling along with deadlines. Yep. But she got her way to block these green measures with the support of the committee's Green member. Yeah. It was all very bizarre. Yeah. So I had to hold out hope that things would change at yeah. stage three. And to be fair, there were some very friendly and cordial discussions with the Minister, but I have to say that she gave the impression of trying to find reason to oppose useful amendments rather than trying to find ways of making them work. Yeah. And there were a number of examples yesterday where she questioned quite rightly the wording of amendments. The, these could have been fixed had we known about the issues. So much for the new politics promised by the First Minister. The valiant efforts on this side of the chamber to improve this bill largely failed. The one crumb from Gillian Martin's table that I had was an amendment that would see us prioritise reuse over recycling of unsold goods in the waste hierarchy. So over the course of four days at stage two and a lengthy stage three, that was it for me. No targets, no holding the government's feet to the fire, yeah. no ambition. Yeah. Now, Maurice Golden, who's been this parliament's greatest cheerleader for the circular economy, suffered a similar fate, and he must be feeling yeah. very, very deflated. Yeah. And, he, and he is deflated. He, took, he spoke earlier about the lack of market, market signals. He spoke of his frustration. I don't blame him. The only thing we can say that was getting recycled yesterday was the Butte House Agreement, as Mark Ruskell did the government's bidding for them. The, the bill won't change much, but there are still potential traps 
for the unwary, like a fish and chip tax. Yeah. Your suppers could become more expensive. Now, my test for this bill is will it lead to change? I have to say, I don't think it will see us reusing things more or recycling more as my failed attempt to push the recycling industry to deal with things like drink cartons showed. The Minister said that her, no, I have no, no time, I'm afraid. Uh, the, the Minister said that she thinks this bill, the one thing that this bill will lead to will be waste managers sharing best practice. Lorna Slater said it could lead to us all carrying our own coffee cups about. Well, if that's it, that's not a very exciting bill. However, I'm prepared to give it a chance, having said all that, not least because there are now measures to tackle fly tipping, and that will please Murdo Fraser and a few crumbs from the Minister's table. Thank you, and I call on Julian Martin to wind up the debate up to five minutes, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Um, while I've only been in my current role for a short time, in my opening remarks I referred to the constructive nature of the engagement that I've had with members and stakeholders of the development of the Bill, and naturally the improvement of the Bill. And I want to point to some of the things that I think that really, um, you know, I, I, thought, I thought about, that were raised about it, stage two in particular, that I went away about and thought about how we can actually achieve the intentions of what. The wording might not have made it onto the face of the bill, but there's lots of things that I'm taking away from the experience of taking the bill forward. I particularly want to mention something, and although uh, Morris Golden's tired and a bit grumpy, um, I, I want to say that the, the, he, he challenged us, uh, and quite rightly, he challenged us to do an analysis of the waste infrastructure that's actually in Scotland at the moment and to see where the gaps were. Now, that's not necessarily something that should go into a piece of legislation, but it is a piece of work that I have I've, I've said that I would undertake in government because I think it's absolutely right. We need to know what we have. We need to know how it's been used and we need to know where the gaps are. Are there certain materials that Scotland cannot recycle? Are there are certain areas that we're missing. And that leads me on, and, and, and I want to thank him for coming up with that constructive um, a, a, a idea. Uh, I will, yes. Douglas Lumsden. I, I think it's, it's, it's right that that um, got progressed, but surely it would have been a lot better if that actual recommendation wasn't actually hollowed out by an, another. Um, another amendment that actually scooped half of that uh, plan out. Yeah. Minister. Yeah, I, 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 think, um, I, I think Douglas Lumsden is maybe getting a little bit confused. And, uh, so I'll, I'll just say that the infrastructure analysis that has to, will be taken will be thorough, and I don't believe that it was hollowed out in, in, in any way. I think it actually gives more flexibility to what it actually can achieve. Anyway, I don't want to spend my whole speech talking about one improvement to the bill. Sarah Boyack um, brought up at stage two um, a lot of issues around, particularly about disposal of contaminated goods, as did many other members as well. And I was really pleased to work with, with Ms Boyack on this, who's obviously got a long experience of working in this area and actually have something in the face of the bill that actually dealt with this specifically. But I also want to talk to all the colleagues that actually mentioned about our responsibility in Scotland not to offshore our waste as well. Now, we are in a situation where, obviously, uh, that's a reserved issue as to what happens at UK level. But we have put things in this bill that shows that we want to make sure that things are dealt with as locally as possible. Again, Morris Golden brought that up at stage two. Other people mentioned about uh, offshore waste. Monica, Monica Lennon mentioned it. Mark Ruskell mentioned it. Many people mentioned it. And so we have put things in this bill which recognises that we must do what we can to make sure that we deal with our own waste as domestically as possible that we can. Um, also, I'm also happy to hear um, Sarah Boyack reference uh, our Welsh colleagues. I've had some really early and good engagement with Hugh Davis uh, from the Welsh Government on this in particular. Um, we give um, the, the Strategic Waste Fund in Scotland gave up £1 billion to local authorities to, to do similar things, but the Welsh have have really got it right in this area. I'm working with Mr Davis on the DRS arrangements as well, and I'm, I'm taking up, hopefully taking an offer of him to actually come down to Wales and to talk to him about measures that are taken there. Um, I'm, I'm astonished that Monica Lennon has not mentioned nappies in her closing speech, um, so I feel that I have to. Um, we, had, we had a great, a great talk, uh, discussion about how that's just one of the areas in which we could have re um, uh, a circular economy and look at things with a gendered lens. 
friends as well, and I, I was, I was uh, pleased to work with her on some of the amendments there. Uh, Lorna Slater recognised the cross-party working, the power of cross-party working, when she has taken forward this bill and saw it develop as well. As we, and I think that really I took my lead from her in that. Uh, and, and, I, and, and she recognises that the measures that we've supported yesterday. Listen, people will put forward amendments; they won't get voted on. The Parliament decides in them. You can, you can, you can move on, or you can accept the fact that actually there was an awful lot of amendments that people put forward but we all had cross-party agreement on which strengthened this bill and I think uh, Lorna uh, Slater mentioned that. Liam MacArthur, I want to thank him for the construction co constructive conversations we had on some of the unintended consequences that there might have been for the third sector of certain amendments that got through. I just want to mention that th this is a significant milestone of course but um, it's, not, it's, on, it's not on its own. Um, alongside the bill we have published our, our draft circular economy and waste, waste route map, which will provide strategic direction to deliver a system-wide vision for Scotland's circular economy for 2030. And the final route map will be published later this year. We are also introducing the extended producer responsibility for packaging alongside other United Kingdom governments, which will require producers to pay local authorities the full net cost of operating an efficient and effective household packaging waste conclude, collection Minister. disposal service. But I, I, I'll leave it there. There's so much more I can say, but I will just uh, m uh, move that the Parliament agrees that the Circular Economy B Scotland Bill will be passed. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Circular Economy Scotland Bill at Stage 3. It's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of Business Motion 13780 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. And I call on Jamie Hepburn to move the motion. Move, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak to the motion. And the question is that Motion 13780 be agreed. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed, and the next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 13792 on approval of an SSI, and I ask Jamie Hepburn, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move the motion. Move, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. And I call on Rachel Hamilton. Up to three minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The SSI relates to the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982 Licensing of Short-Term Lets Amendment Order 2024. Scotland's tourism sector is an incredibly important part of our economy, both locally and nationally, and I draw members to my register of interests as a director of a small hotel in the borders. It's also something which is incredibly important to our rural, coastal and island communities, and accommodation providers have been long calling for the Scottish Government to reconsider the way it has approached its long its short-term licensing scheme since it was introduced, and we are glad that some of these calls have been heard with this amendment. These amendments that relate primarily to technical details are welcome and show a willingness to listen to those who understand the sector best. Temporary licence exemptions and provisional licence granting for new STLs will help relieve some burden on struggling businesses and allow the quality of Scotland's accommodation to grow. Additionally, addressing the loophole to permit licences to be transferred to a new host will allow less disruption for those visiting remote rural and island communities that may have fewer alternative places to stay. However, while the principle behind these amendments remains sound, these amendments still do not go far enough, nor fully listen to the concerns of accommodation providers across Scotland. Stakeholders such as SLE have highlighted the lack of detail in these amendments, stating that while the increased engagement with the accommodation sector is welcome, a clarity shortfall is evident, which can lead to unintended consequences from this regulation, burdening even more the short-term let industry. The Association of Scotland Self-Caterers have said that by far the biggest obstacle to the successful implementation of STL licensing is onerous dual licensing and planning requirements that go along with it, which these amendments do not address. And if I may, in respect of the intention of the 2019 Planning Act, existing businesses should be protected but not impacted by retrospective planning considerations. This requires, and I, and I know that the ASSC is in conversations with the Business and Planning Minister on this, amendments to the STL licensing order as per Burness Paul opinion, amendments to STL licensing guidance as per Burness Paul opinion, more critically a new use class order for short-term lets. 
Existing operators would automatically be moved to this UCO. It should be a mixed UCO, residential and STL, to enable properties to revert back to residential without the requirement for a planning permission. Furthermore, groups such as the Scottish Bed and Breakfast Association have similarly stated that 77% of their membership reported negative or extremely negative impacts on their business since STL licensing came into force. And the Short Term Accommodation Association have called for comprehensive review into the short term let licensing scheme to fully understand its impact on our vital short term sector. And we agree that this should happen. I I am running out of time. I will stop there. There's so much more to say, and I hope members will agree with the points that I have made. And whilst we agree with the points that have been addressed with the technical amendments, we will not be supporting uh, this amendment tonight, and we will be abstaining. And I hope other members will do so too. Thank you. And I call on Shirley Ann Somerville to respond up to three minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak um, on this SSI today because it is a, a very important um, SSI, both uh, for uh, safety standards uh, that we have throughout Scotland, but very importantly to recognise the contribution that this important sector makes to the tourism industry. The short term licensing scheme does deliver a set of basic safety standards to protect guests, hosts, and communities and guarantee high quality accommodation across Scotland. It is those core principles around safety that underpin our approach throughout. When the Minister appeared at committee, he made clear that the amendments in this order deliver on our commitment to make technical updates as a direct result of feedback from a range of stakeholders. And he and I thank them very much for their continued discussions that they are having with government. He has also made clear that we are still within a transitional period when many thousands of operators have recently taken action to comply with legislation and authorities are still processing applications for existing hosts. Although I understand that some groups in the sector are encouraging us to go further, any action must be taken forward in a measured way. I am happy to give way to Craig Hoy. Craig Hoy. Uh, ap ap apologies, uh, presiding officer. I, I think I hit the button by mistake. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I thank Craig Hoy for the intervention. I'm happy to agree with him um, on, on that point. <laughs> um, presiding officer, we will, of course, continue to work and listen with stakeholders. The industry advisory group chaired by Visit Scotland and which several industry representatives are a part of has met at least 14 times in the past two years. The most recent meeting was also attended by the Minister for Housing. Some of the provisions in the order, such as ensuring a smoother processing for transferring licences and introducing more flexibility on the use of temporary exemptions, were included as a direct result, offering technical clarifications and operational improvements for businesses. The approach that has been taken in this order aligns with both our commitment to support businesses and with the Verity House Agreement, recognising that licensing authorities have statutory responsibility for delivering this scheme. It ensures that high quality accommodation that visitors inspect in Scotland is maintained and prioritises the importance of doing business. Presiding officer, given I think Rachel Hamilton actually said she agrees with the technical aspects that are actually in this SSI, I would urge the Chamber to vote eh, for this. The Minister, eh, myself, and indeed other ministers will certainly. Rachel Hamilton. Shelley Ann Somerville for taking the intervention. Um, it seems as though uh, there looks to be a move for the government to continue to speak with the Association of Short Term uh, Let Industry and that sector, particularly on reviewing the Short Term Let Licensing Scheme. Is that something that the government could commit to following this? Winding up, Cabinet Secretary. Certainly, President Officer. We are absolutely uh, determined to, to, to carry on that discussion. Uh, the Housing Minister has met with, with stakeholders on a number uh, of, of occasions, uh, as have other ministers as well, and we continue to take up that dialogue. While we absolutely uh, are determined to move forward with the short term licensing because of those safety measures uh, that I mentioned at the start, uh, I can assure the Chamber that we will continue to engage with everyone, and indeed the Minister for Housing looks forward to doing so very. Uh, very soon. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of five Parliamentary Bureau motions. And I ask Jamie Hepburn, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 13781 on approval of proposed revised Social Security Charter, 13782 on committee membership, 13783 and 13784 on substitution on committees and 13795 on committee remits. 
Move, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. And the question on these motions will be put at decision time, and there are seven questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that Amendment 13759.3 in the name of Douglas Lumsden, which seeks to amend Motion 13759 in the name of Gillian Martin on Scottish Government priorities tackling the climate emergency, be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.